This is our um, pure user interface. This is the dashboard page. We see here like basic information. We see latency information. We see that there's currently a load of around 50 megabyte per second going on. If you go to storage, we see the number of vol configured volumes, the number of volume snapshots on the array. And on the bottom, we see offload targets. Here we see that we currently have like one configured offload target using this uh, AWS S3 bucket. May I ask a couple of questions that are kind of in two different directions? One is I'm wondering about the network connectivity. Yeah, you'll run over a direct connect so that you can use an S3 endpoint directly. Yes. Um, OK, cool. Not necessarily direct connect, just any communication to as an S3 endpoint. It can be direct connect. It can be just normal internet. Yeah, um, well, um, in that case, in the, in the case of you know, normal internet, you'd be using a public be using the public API. So I was asking about, you know, this is coming off your array. Presumably, people are going to want to keep it private. So that was why I was asking about that. And um, I noticed that you're using a, uh, in this demo, you're using an access key, a secret access key. Can I use an IAM role? Um, but the IAM role then gets an access key. Um, that is then provided when you're connecting. You can create any IAM role. Our best practices guide has like some best practices which IAM role to create to minimize like that. For example, the IAM role that we recommend only has access to this one bucket, uh, so that like this array with the credential it has cannot access like any other buckets a customer has. And we have best practices guide for that. It uses the public REST interface, but like obviously the data is encrypted. Um, during the um, transfer, and it's encrypted at rest. So even when it is using the public internet access, it's encrypted um, on the wire, and, and it is encrypted at rest. So do you have customers who are subject to regulatory requirements who use pure storage arrays, who use the snapshot capability over the public S3 interface? I have to give this to Kunal. No, so I, the, when we send data from uh, the flash array to the cloud, we always send it over secure. Like, you know, we send it over HTTP SSL. We always make sure, you can't even enable Cloud Snap if you don't have a secure connection between your on-prem flash array and the, and the S3 target. So we ensure that. Obviously, direct connect is one way to do that, but that's more from a latency perspective and making sure your backup SLAs are met. But we always make sure the, the transfer of data is secure. So I don't think we've had any customers really kind of um, go, you know, where the, the security kind of became an issue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We see here our offload target connecting to a bucket. If a customer wants to set up an offload target, they click here, select S3, the customer will recreate a bucket, give us a bucket here, provide access key and secret <coughs> access key. They give the offload target name. It can be the bucket name itself. It can be anything else they want. This is then the name that we use in our like, internal user interface to show this offload target. After this has been done, we can go to protection groups. And protection group is, as Naveen told, our unit of quest consistent snapshot. A protection group can consist of like, a number of volumes. And when a protection group snapshot is taken, we take a Fresh consistent atomic snapshot over all these different volumes in this protection group. Mm. Let's select the cloud field air protection group. You see here, protection group is like two volumes, and we see on a target that is currently connected to the S3 target. And here can we add other targets. The targets can be an offload target, or it can be another flash array. When it's another flash array, it uses asynchronous replication between these two different flash arrays. When it's a cloud target, it uses like, the portable snapshotting system that we're currently introducing. This also means that this user interface is used to our customers since like four or five years since we introduced asynchronous replication. So, and just by selecting a different offload target, we select the different protocols. This means for existing customers, this is, like, this is like an already well-known system to configure their snapshotting. Here on the right side, we see our application schedule. Here we configure that the snapshot is taken every four hours and then offloaded to the cloud. And then we take these um, snapshots, then we keep the snapshots in the cloud for seven days, and then one snapshot per day for another seven days, uh, 14 days. Afterwards, the snapshot is automatically removed and the space is reclaimed. 
So what is what is stored in the S3 bucket specifically? It is the snapshot itself, right? It is a self-contained snapshot. Yeah. Um, containing the da uh, data and metadata about the snapshot. I will talk about this in a couple of slides. Okay. Um, we can come back to that. Okay, I'll, I'll remember it. Is Thank there a, an estimation tool to determine how much storage you're gonna be using in S3? So you can you know, try to price out what it's gonna cost you? Um, that's something actually, so we are looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So Cloud Snap has been available for a month, month and a half now. Okay. And we are looking at like sizing tools to your point. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to do that probably in like Pure One, which is our management portal that kind of sits on top of our flash array and flash plates that, and also gives you like a snapshot catalog. Okay. That's where we want to try to start evaluating where we can provide um, sizing tools to your point, like where we can kind of estimate, like, you know, how much will your full snapshot cost, what your incremental snapshots are costing. Um, um, so, yeah, absolutely something we are looking at. Okay. Um, if we now go back to storage and we click on the offload target, we see all the snapshots that are currently stored in the S3 target. Those are the snapshots that are currently stored there with their data. If we click on this last button here, we are starting the restore process, creating a snapshot, a local snapshot back on the flash array and like pulling the data in that is needed to reflect the snapshot. About this restore process, I will talk about more after the demo. That, that snapshot restore process is no different if it's on the array, if it's in S3. It just so happens that that one is in S3. It just happens that yeah. the data and the snapshot metadata is yeah. currently in S3, and uh, we take the data from the, uh, that is currently in S3 and pull back the data that we need. We yeah. pull back the minimal amount of data that we need to like, reassemble the, uh, the snapshot on the flash array. Yeah. And I think that's another thing I want to point out. You know, we're talking about overhead. And yes, there is some overhead you know, when you're doing the processing. But because most of the times our customers are obviously going to recover this snapshot to the same flash array they offload it to, the only reason they may go to another flash array is like if that one was down or they're trying to make it available in another one. So because it's efficient on the restore side, it kind of out, out, outweighs the overhead, you know, which is what we've seen in most cases. This is our pure one side. It's like our fleet management side in, in the cloud. And all the customer can see all the different arrays, all the different snapshots, and see like when something was replicated like from a local array to a different array or from a local array to a cloud. They see a complete view of everything on this slide, including like how long the snapshot take and like if it was it in time or not. <laughs> 